Okay, well, what I will do is I will introduce you to the speakers that we have here today. We've got John Douglas from First Response, who is a fantastic chap to know uh, in a data breach situation. Uh, his forensic skills are second to none, and I can vouch for that, having used him personally on a few matters. Uh, and then we've got the brilliant Debbie Venn, who is one of the partners in our commercial team. And um, what she doesn't know about UK GDPR and data protection is not worth knowing, I can tell you that for something. Um, I'm one of the partners in the dispute resolution team at DMH Stallard, so um, I'm the person you come to when it all goes horribly wrong, um, or if you need some advice on how to protect your position before that happens, so sort of risk management advice. So uh, if we can move on to the next slide, Amber. So today, what we're going to talk a bit about, and this is the second one in our series looking at sort of data breaches, we looked at that uh, around, uh, around employees previously, and today we're going to look at data breaches within your business. So Debbie's going to speak about protecting your business assets, looking into the various ways of doing that and the sort of statutory uh, implementations in place at the moment. Um, then I'll have a look at what happens when it all goes wrong, uh, looking at some court decisions and what kind of claims could be brought against you as a company and the trends we're seeing. And then John's going to speak a bit about data breaches and um, response plans and preparation for all of that. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Debbie and, and let her mm -hmm. tell you all about protecting your business assets. Lovely. Thanks very much, Nika. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, this morning, I'm going to um, uh, give you an insight into some of the um, areas that we look at when protecting your business assets. And although I will be primarily focusing on um, some of the additional legal obligations around personal data um, and data protection legislation, it's worth noting that actually what you need to um, look at and consider when thinking about protecting data is your other data. So confidential information, commercially sensitive information, and it might even be information connected to your intellectual property, like trade secrets and things like that. Some of the principles that we'll be discussing this morning will apply to that type of data as well as personal data. Um, and I'll, um, I'll give you an overview of, of, of which apply to uh, what type of data as well. Um, so if we, um, thank you Amber, move on to the first slide. So um, what I'll be um, going through first of all is a sort of an overview of what you need to consider when you're looking at your internal processes, you know, so what do you have in place inwardly looking rather than sort of outwardly looking? Um, and that might include things like um, your internal privacy policies, um, it would be things like um, policies on handling personal data, what um, usage people can make of that data, um, and considering that in the context of personal data, as I say, and then also um, other um, uh, confidential or other information that needs to be kept secure as well. Um, obviously, there's then the external position around um, dealing with external uh, third parties where data might be going between yourself and other third parties and what we need to have in place for that. Um, I'll also then be looking at um, the legal requirements under GDPRs, a very, very brief overview, otherwise we'd be here all day if I was going to be doing a full GDPR session, um, and also what we need to consider around what happens in the event that there's a data breach for the purposes of ICO notifications, timeframes, and what you need to do when you're looking at dealing with data subjects. Um, I'll, I'll ha also have a bit of a practical um, uh, sort of summary at the end of, of my section just to, for you to think about internally and what you might need to be doing to put some of these things in place um, and as I say some of the things that we need to look at aren't just the um, additional obligations that you might have under law and um, particularly when you're looking at confidential information and commercially sensitive information um, you might have other legal obligations attached to contracts that you've entered into with third parties. So um, that would need to be considered as part of your, of your overall review of um, data and assets and, and, and how those need to be dealt with. Um, as I say, what I'm going to do, is, first of all, though, is kick off with personal data statutory obligations. Um, so... Um, an overview of legal requirements. So um, personal data, everybody's probably um, uh, more than well versed with GDPRs and the Data Protection Act 2018 by now. Um, and it's something we've lived with for a while. Some people have given it um, the full weight that it, it deserves. Others, I think, haven't necessarily looked at it um, with, um, with much detail and I think the difficulty that we come into at the moment is that people know about GDPRs, individuals more importantly know quite a lot about GDPRs and um, that could cause you issues if you're not doing the right thing. 
So I think just in terms of the very, very basics on GDPRs, obviously the main um, reason they were brought in was to ensure that people's um, personal data was protected, particularly looking at the protection of data relating to children um, and um, what um, businesses should be doing for the purposes of protecting that data. But it also has um, introduced very strict compliance provisions, which businesses now need to demonstrate that they adhere to. However, it does um, mean that the main principles that you've got to um, adhere to are set out in these six principles, which were very, very similar to the Data Protection 1998. And it's effectively to ensure that if you're dealing with personal data, you are collecting it and dealing with it for a lawful purpose. So you've got a proper legal basis for, for having that data and doing something with it, and that you're dealing with it fairly and transparently. Transparently is basically that you're telling people what you're doing with their data. And the best way for dealing with that is a privacy policy, because you can explain to people in that privacy policy what you're going to be doing with their data. So they're a very useful tool for that purpose. The other thing you need to make sure you're doing is, is it says purpose limitation. But basically what that means is you're only using the data for the purpose that you've collected it and you're keeping the amount of data that you are holding minimal. So you only hold the bits that you need, nothing excessive and nothing that you don't need. That data that you hold also needs to be accurate and you should only be storing it for a um, limited period of time. What period of time that is um, will be dependent on the type of data um, and that's something that you need to consider as part of the review. Um, but you also need to make sure that when you're dealing with that data you do so um, with integrity and confidentiality. So um, you only um, dis uh, disclose the data to those that need to know about it. Um, and you have to remain accountable for your um, uh, actions under data protection. So those are the basic principles. Um, and obviously, when we're looking at personal data, we are looking at um, individual uh, sort of data that identifies individuals. It's worth noting that if you process, collect and process any special category data, so medical information, information about religious beliefs, political opinions, etc., there are additional legal obligations under GDPRs that apply to processing that type of data. It's usually that you can only process it with consent unless some of the other exemptions apply. So if you do collect that type of data, please be aware that you've got um, additional um, obligations to make sure that data is kept secure. And it might be that you need to put in additional things like um, encryption or other type of um, mechanisms in place to ensure that that data has additional security wrapped around it. And when we're talking about processing data, it's basically doing anything with it. It could be obtaining it, um, uh, passing it on to around the business. It could be booking a holiday, it could be um, processing someone's order for a sale of products, but it also just means holding it. So even if you're holding it, that would be classified as processing. So it's a very wide definition. Um, and um, one of the things that we need to, or that we will be looking at today is um, the sort of the security, cybersecurity uh, side of things. So that really sits with what they call the sixth um, principle under GDPRs, which is basically ensuring that data is processed in a way with appropriate security um, measures in place to make sure that that data um, doesn't get lost, destroyed um, or damaged um, in, in any way. So those technical and organisational measures um, are very key. <clears throat> OK, so um, what happens if you don't um, comply? So under UK GDPRs, if you have a non-compliance issue, so there's something that you haven't got in place, which you should have in place under GDPRs, the fines can be up to 8.7 million or 2% of gross global turnover. If you actually suffer a data breach, that can go up to £17.5 million pounds or 4% um, of gross global turnover. I've not yet heard of fines going up to that amount other than in extreme circumstances. Um, and um, obviously, if you were dealing with EU personal data, the EU GDPRs have um, slightly different levels of fine because they're in euros. So it's 10 million euros or 20 million euros for the two different tiers. But it's worth bearing in mind that in addition to these fines, which I think are what people had been um, really concentrating on when GDPRs came in. It's the other types of actions that might be problematic. So illegal actions, if you've breached a contract and you haven't held data like you were supposed to, or reputational damage, which is potentially one of the worst, because if, if you're not looking after data and suddenly there's a data breach um, and um, you haven't done what you're supposed to, then actually your customers are going to be um, pretty upset. And that could be very damaging to your, to your brand. 
Um, there might be criminal proceedings depending on the type of breach because there are some criminal implications under GDPRs. And it's also um, worth noting that data subjects have a right to compensation, and I'll come on to that in just a moment. Um, the ICO can also issue enforcement notices so they can get involved as the regulator if, if there's a problem. So yeah, not, not great if it goes wrong, um, but um, if something has happened and there has been a data breach, you can make sure that your um, losses or risk um, is minimised by doing certain things. And I'm, I'm going to just run through a few of these at the moment. Um, firstly, what you're going to have to do is if there has been a data breach or, or you've um, become aware that there's a problem with um, data that you're holding, you need to analyse as quickly as possible what's gone wrong and try and minimise that damage or any further breach um, uh, that might occur following on from that. Now, um, the notifications that you might have to make to the information commissioner's office if there has been a security breach is only where one um, leads to the accidental and unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorised disclosure of or access to personal data. So it's very specific what you would have to, um, what type of data breach there would have to be for you to actually notify the um, ICO that there has been a data breach. Now, <clears throat> um, if that um, has happened, then um, what the ICO has said is that you need to notify if you're a data controller you need to notify them within 72 hours of discovery that there's been a data breach um, if you're acting as a data processor rather than you're uh, being a data controller you have to notify the data controller that you're processing the data on behalf of without undue delay so not necessarily a, spe a specific time period but um, without undue delay and most data processing agreements you will see that there's a time period that they add maybe 24 hours or 48 hours um, to notify the data controller so that the data control is getting some form of um, uh, control over the notification period. But I think it's worth um, uh, just pointing out in terms of the notifications to the ICO, um, businesses seem to have been notifying um, as much as possible because I think they're worried that if you if they fail to notify, that's actually classified as a, as a data, as a breach of the GDPRs themselves. So they want to make sure that they're notifying. But sometimes they might not have all the information about what the security breach has been. So they're um, notifying with limited information and then updating that, which is the sort of the recommended um, uh, safe approach. Um, so uh, something to, to consider. And as I say, when it comes to um, failing to notify, uh, if, for example, you are um, a data controller with a data processing agreement in place, you might want um, a provision in that which says uh, the data processor would be in breach of the um, data processing agreement in breach of contract if they don't notify you of a data breach. Um, because it's a way of making sure that as the controller you're keeping tight rein on your processes. So that's around the notification side um, for the regulation, uh, regulator side. Now, data subjects is, um, is another ball game. Um, and if an individual's um, personal data has been um, the subject of a data breach, um, then you will need to potentially notify that data subject if there's a high risk to their data um, without undue delay. Now, in theory, there's no need to notify them if their data has been encrypted or you've taken steps to make sure that their data is no longer um, subject to high risk risk or if it is a dis disproportionate effort. But these three um, uh, bullet points are actually construed quite narrowly. So um, it's generally the data subject will be um, uh, need to be informed unless um, you can really narrow down on those uh, three exceptions. If you are going to notify the individual and um, that there's been a data breach, you've got to explain what's happened in plain language. You can't use, you know, major technical terms that they're not going to understand. You need to ex explain what the implication has been about the data breach so that they understand what's happened to their data. You need to give them contact information for if they have any inquiries. And if um, uh, details of, of any like consequences of that breach and what you've done to reduce that risk and mit mitigate those um, losses. Now, <clears throat> an individual will have a potential right to compensation if they've suffered material or non-material damage, but at the moment there's no real guidance on what those amounts would be. It would be something that would be determined um, by the UK courts, um, and you would only have to pay that compensation if you can show that um, you know it, it's happened because you weren't necessarily doing what you were supposed to so if you can show that you weren't responsible in any way for the breach then in theory you wouldn't then be liable for compensation but as it's a potential loss um, that the business may have you you should really consider that as part of um, as part of your breach plan 
So moving on, what is your breach plan, <laughs> I suppose, is the next thing. So um, as, a, as a business, do you have a data breach policy? And um, this is something that uh, and a process to follow. If you do, it can take pressure off in, in, in extreme circumstances, because at least you know what you've got to do um, in the event that something does happen. It can also help um, demonstrate your compliance with GDPRs because it shows that you know what you would be dealing with um, in the event that there is a breach. Um, the ICO look on them quite favorably, favorably sorry, um, and um, that can help reduce potential fines if you can show that you are generally complying, but there has just been a, a problem which has caused a data breach. And it can also reduce the amount of compensation you'd have to um, uh, pay if there's a policy and a process which explains how you would narrow down that breach and make sure that there's less risk to the data and, and less damage caused to the individuals. Um, the main things that we would want to ensure that are included in the policy would be an escalation process so you know um, who you would be um, escalating a problem to and um, what response um, would need to be put in place for that. You would want to try and make sure that you've got some um, notification um, section in there so what happens in, in the event in terms of time frames and if you've got to involve third parties like legal PR forensics etc potentially also your insurers um, you might want to include a process for informing data subjects about the breach and, and communications or press releases but that might be something that's dealt with in more detail in the event that um, there is a breach but the most important thing to, to consider on this is that you review it and update it the policy needs to be kept up to date with different um, technologies. And also internally, you might have business changes, uh, you might acquire different sections of the business um, or new companies and grow as a group. And actually that will have an effect on the process and how that operates. So it does need to be reviewed and updated on an, on an ongoing basis. Um, I'm just going to quickly mention technical and organisational measures. This is something probably that John will be going into in a bit more detail, but looking at the, the measures you've got in place, you know, you'll need to work with your IT team to make sure that if you are dealing with certain sensitive information that you might have additional encryption methods or other um, password protection or other types of um, uh, technical measures in place to keep data secure. Um, and those measures should be regularly tested to make sure that they are actually up to date and that there isn't any problem um, with those in terms of vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we would also um, recommend is that in relation to particularly sensitive personal data, you restrict the staff access to the data to those that you, who really need to know it, and that helps minimise those risks. I believe the slides will be forwarded afterwards, so I'll leave you to read the rest of that one, and I'll just skip on to my last um, sl uh, sort of slide, um, which is the key things that you need to consider. So in summary, the sort of things that you need to consider would be, firstly, undertake an audit of your systems to identify areas of vulnerability. This might be something that you already did at the point of GDPRs coming in, but it does need to be reviewed and updated on an ongoing basis. So it's, it's something that you need to make sure is on your um, sort of ongoing uh, list of, of things to do. Um, if you are contracting with third parties, you would want to make sure that you've got relevant data um, uh, provisions in place, and that includes whether it's personal data or protecting other business information, so some confidentiality um, provisions. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is to train your staff on a continued basis to make sure that um, you are identifying to them what your obligations are with um, regard to data protection and cyber issues, because that helps identify risks if there is a problem in the business, but also helps reduce human error, which is one of the biggest factors of, um, of cyber risk. Um, if you haven't got a data breach policy in place, consider putting one in place to help manage a data breach. It would really be helpful to the business in case that um, uh, something happens and test and update it um, as well. Um, you are, would want to consider insurance if you haven't already got separate cyber insurance, consider whether that's already covered under another one of your policies, but double check that. And if something does go wrong, act quickly to prevent further damage and look at whether or not you need to um, issue any notifications um, and how you deal with management of communications with data sub. Jokes. And my last point is, is really to say learn from experience and update as you go along because, you know, something goes wrong, you learn lessons from that and then hopefully you can um, implement um, those lessons back into the business to, to protect further. So um, that's enough for me, I think, this morning, but um, I'll be um, staying on for Q&A at the end, but I'm going to pass on to Nicola, um, who's going to explain what happens if it all goes wrong.
<laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Debbie. Uh, that's excellent. Great uh, information there. Hopefully very, very useful to all the businesses uh, joining us today. So as Debbie's explained, there's quite a bit of legislation, as you can see, that governs how you hold someone's data and what you can and can't do with it. There are very strict requirements on how you process it. And therefore, it's so important that you have the right systems and measures in place to protect that information. But you know, what happens when it goes wrong? Uh, or you inadvertently disclose that data, or you lose it, or, or worse, it, it's taken from you. Now, I'm going to focus on claims being brought against you as a business, um, as that would most likely be on the basis that an individual claims that they've suffered either financial loss or distress, uh, and they will seek compensation against you. Now, data breaches often involve financial information, personal details, perhaps medical documents, to name a few, um, and individuals will be claiming against you on the basis that you have breached the data protection laws. There has to have been an unauthorised use of the information, so essentially it has to have been let out into the public domain without the individual's consent, and there is no legal justification for having done so. The individuals can bring a claim to the ICO um, and they will seek to investigate and decide if the business has done wrong, but what they don't do is they don't award compensation, but a finding in favour of the individual with the ICO could then be taken to the courts to seek compensation. So what would they be claiming? Well, they'd be claiming for a breach of the UK GDPR. Uh, they essentially also probably be claiming for breach of private information, uh, breach of confidence and also negligence. And I'm going to look at, in a bit more detail at a few cases uh, to see how the court applies these and what thresholds are currently in place uh, and need to be passed before compensation is actually awarded. Now it's worth noting at this stage that this is very much an area where the law is fast developing. There's not as yet specific guidance from the courts as to how much an individual will be awarded. Um, and some claims may be seen as de minimis. So although there is a data breach, um, the data breach doesn't actually include personal or sensitive information. Um, but if it does, so if it is personal records or medical information that has been disclosed, that's likely to carry a lot more weight with the court. But one thing is for sure, we are in a world where claimants have become much more sophisticated and they're much more willing to embrace the court process. And also there are a lot of claimant firms out there that chase this kind of work looking for group litigation. There's also an increased public awareness around data rights and the lack of requirements to show any real loss plays into the hands of claimants. But that said, the lower levels that seem to be awarded luckily aren't that encouraging. And there have been a number of decisions recently in favour of defendants, which is helpful. So let's have a look at a few of them. Uh, the first of which is Warren uh, versus DSG Retail, which is Dixon's to you and I. Um, this provided some much needed clarity on how the courts will deal with claims where there has been a data breach as a result of unlawful actions of a third party. So here there was a cyber attack and personal data was compromised. And the claimant in this situation brought a claim for breach of the Data Protection Act 98, so that was prior to the current Act. They also had a claim for misuse of private information and breach of confidence and negligence. And those claims often sit hand in hand as a package together. But what Dixon's did here is they applied for summary judgment and to strike out all of the causes of action apart from the data protection principles. And the reason for that was that for a claim for misuse of private information and breach of confidence, there must be a use or a misuse of that information. Now here, the defendant had failed to secure the data, but that's not a use or a misuse. And neither of the claims impose a duty of data security, so the court struck both out. Insofar as the claim for negligence is concerned, that failed as well because the court held that with negligence there's no need again to impose a duty of care because data protection principles again already have those in place um, and see uh, the claimant here had not brought any claim for personal injury. So this case is helpful as it shows that the court are not going to entertain kitchen sink claims. If there has been a data breach then the claimant needs to focus and narrow the issues. Now here the claimant had insurance in place and that was the reason why they added on the additional claims of misuse of private information and breach of confidence in the hope that if they succeeded then the premiums for the insurance and also after the event insurance would be recoverable. 
So moving on to the next case that I wanted to look at, this is Stadler versus Curry, so another sort of electrical company case. And here the individual raised a claim against Curry's on the basis that they bought a smart TV and it was defective. Uh, they'd set it up with all of their personal details, their financial information, but when they realised it was defective, they returned it to Curry's. Now, Curry sold the unit on for repair and resale, um, but they forgot to wipe it. So the data was left on it. They didn't do a factory reset and somebody else bought it and the claimant's Amazon account was used to buy a film. So the claimant brought a claim again for breach of UK GDPR, uh, misuse of private information and breach of confidence. And this was on the basis that all of the apps left on the TV contained their personal information and financial details. They also included a claim in this case for damages for distress. Now, in coming to its decision, the court applied the recent case uh, of Dixon's, Warren versus Dixon's. And they looked at the misuse of private information um, and they said, well, again, you have to have made wrongful use of the information. And here they felt that Curry's hadn't. OK, they hadn't done what they should have done they sh in respect of data security and they should have checked the information on the TV, but they hadn't actually used that information. In relation to the negligence claim, they also struck that out and said, again, there was no need to impose a duty of care because the UK GDPR and the Data Protection Act already had statutory duties provided within them. Here as well, in addition, the anxiety that the claimant was claiming, the court felt that that wasn't sufficient to establish negligence. So again, in this case, it was held that yes, UK GDPR claim had potentially sufficient prospects and it wouldn't be struck out. However, damages for a non-trivial breach uh, are not recoverable. So the court said, you know, this is a de minimis claim and the threshold is quite low and, and you can see what they would be willing to apply. So moving on to the next case, uh, which is Cleary and Marston. Um, here, uh, there was a letter that was intended for the claimant um, and it was inadvertently sent to a colleague. Claimant claimed for data protection legislation breach, breach of confidence and misuse of private information and sought damages. Now, the defendant admitted that this was human error and it was a one off and the claimant accepted that. And also the colleague said that he never read the letter. What the claimant did here is they issued in the High Court, they had a conditional fee arrangement in place, so sort of no win, no fee arrangement with their solicitors. They also had an after the event insurance policy. And they issued in the High Court and said that their cost to trial would be in the region of about £50,000. Um, the claimant put in a witness statement as to why it should be in the High Court, feeling that this was a specialist claim, and so it should be heard by judges in the High Court. But when the court got its hands on the case, it said, no, this is a routine data protection claim. It's essentially the same claim. And despite the fact that you've got three causes of action there, it, it's duplication. This case is more than capable of being dealt with in the county courts. They can deliver access to justice. And it's essentially a small claims matter. So it's under £10,000. And the reason they wanted it to be on a small claims track and in the county court is then you have a protection from costs award and also the court could award a fair and reasonable sum. Now, this case was a prime example of really how not to conduct litigation for a low value data breach claim. The judge felt that because of the low level of damages, it, it wasn't a complex matter and the county court was the correct forum. Yes, there was a breach of confidence claim, or if there had been, I should say, a breach of confidence claim here, you should start it in the High Court. But then the High Court can simply transfer it to the County Court, which is exactly what happened here. So I think this shows that claimants need a little bit to be a little bit careful about what arguments they put forward and which forums are the correct ones for low value data breach claims. Little is going to be gained by the claimant overcomplicating their claim when the data breach is obvious. And all that really remains to be decided is the level of compensation. So what does this all mean for you as a business? Well, next slide, please. You can't really afford to ignore uh, your obligations regarding data. I think Debbie made that absolutely abundantly clear. And these cases show that you have to be very careful because there is compensation that will be awarded, albeit that it might be low sums. But you need to make sure that you've got all of the relevant processes in place and really ignore the ICO if something goes wrong and indeed your GDPR obligations at your peril. 
I think risk management is key for any business, both before, during and after any issues have arisen. Before, you need to make sure that you've got all the processes and procedures in place, making sure you've met all of your obligations. And that's really going to stand you in good stead if a data breach does occur. We can help advise you on those policies and processes, but also after a breach has occurred, it's good to get lawyers on board, particularly in relation to notifications to the ICO, because you have to do that all within specific timeframes. And also it's useful to look at any claims that might be intimated against you or indeed have already been raised. In so far as claims are concerned, you need to make sure that you're responding properly. So thinking about the commercialities of the situation and looking at the legal position in detail. Where there's one claim, there may well be more. I mentioned before the kind of firms that are chasing after this kind of work, group litigation. So you need to be mindful of that and make sure that you've got a game plan in place uh, and you're protecting the business moving forward. Sometimes settling those claims uh, is a good idea, but you need to be mindful of terms, make sure that you, you are protecting the business there and that it's not opening you up to further criticism or litigation. And after any data breach, looking back at what's happened is key. Looking at a lessons learned approach, making sure that everything is now correctly in place so that it doesn't happen again. Although if it does happen again, that you have all of the boxes ticked and you're not going to be fined. Engaging forensic experts like John is a very good idea as they can assist looking at what's happened, why it's happened and make sure that your systems are more robust moving forward. So on that note, I'm going to pass over to John uh, and he's hopefully going to be able to provide you with some detail around forensics and how he can help your business in the future. Hopefully, <laughs> that would be, uh, be useful. <laughs> I'm John Douglas. I'm the Technical Director and Head of Forensic Services at First Response. Uh, we're an incident response and cybersecurity company, and we also provide litigation support to law firms. If you'd like to know more about me and my background, you can find uh, my bio either on LinkedIn or on our website. So this morning, uh, I thought as a follow on to our previous session, it would be helpful to set out a bit more detail about the ways a forensic specialist can help you prepare for and respond to an employee or malicious threat actor stealing your data. I also thought it might be a useful time to look at the trends that we saw in 2022 and what this means for us in 2023. In the last session, we touched on some things that you should be focusing, focusing on at a, a fairly high level. And today I wanted to dive a little bit deeper. I also focused on the insider threat last time. And today I'll be looking more at the malicious threat actor, typically organized criminal networks or organized criminal groups. So lots of organizations genuinely believe they can deal with a data loss event on the fly and simply respond to events as they unfold. As we'll see, this is typically a recipe for disaster. The data shown on this slide comes from the ICO and relates to reports that they received between 2019 and last year. It's fair to say that given the ICO's sort of unofficial position on not really pushing prosecution for, of companies that lose data, but more trying to, to get them uh, compliant, that many smaller organizations simply don't report incidents as there's no real downside to not reporting and for fear of the reputational harm that may result if they do report. That said, the ICO is probably the one source that gives us the best overall picture of cyber attacks and data loss events as it relates to the UK. One of the main things that the Information Commissioner's Office observed was a huge increase in the number of ransomware attacks from 2019 through 2022. Obviously, it's fair to say that this period covered COVID. So when lockdowns were in place and organizations were struggling to meet the requirement to have their workforce working remotely, as opposed to having them in the office. This was a period with quite lax network security as IT teams just tried to make things work. It's also the case that in the early part of 2022, we saw an increase in attacks coming from the territory of Russia, directly in response to the Ukraine war. As the UK government came out in support of Ukraine, we saw a threefold increase in the number of attacks coming from Russian territory and also from the territory of Iran and China. It's quite sobering to realize that every quarter, 2,000 significant data loss events are reported to the ICO. Given the under-reporting I mentioned earlier, there's a good chance to say, or a good case to say that that figure is actually much higher. These events can be anything from a, an employee mistaking, mistakenly emailing sensitive company data to the wrong party, right through to a full-scale attack by an external threat actor. 
The ICO has also recorded a number of key observations during this period, and this reflects our own experience in dealing with data loss events in the UK over the last 12 months. It's fair to say, though, that whilst the ICO is working with organisations of every size, typically at first response, we're focused on small business. So where the ICO is only seeing 40% of UK small businesses not having any kind of incident response or IR plan in place, we see it probably closer to 90%. The main points that result from this are listed in the bullet points below. This is the ICO's list, but I have to say I, I kind of concur with, with their findings. Many small companies outsource their IT. Very often these IT companies are working on wafer thin margins and probably don't have any internal security specialism or expertise themselves. So they're not always best placed to be relied upon as a, a one-stop shop. Many organizations don't know what critical data assets they have, and they very often don't always know exactly where they are. For example, old servers that have been decommissioned may still contain sensitive data relating to intellectual property or sensitive personal data that the company can't risk having exposed. Very often, no formal risk assessment has been carried out. This means the organization hasn't thought particularly hard about what happens in the event that sensitive documents are compromised or released into the public domain. The combination of not knowing what critical assets they have or where they reside, coupled with not knowing what the impact losses, what the impact of loss of those assets would have, is cause for concern. We noted that very often organizations don't have acceptable use policies in place. And whilst I certainly don't want to sound like I'm a specialist in law, especially with Nicola and Debbie on this call, in my experience, the acceptable use policy is one of the single most useful documents that you have in dealing with an employee who is potentially not acting in the best interests of the company when it comes to misuse of computer equipment or company data. It should set out in fairly clear terms what an employee can and can't be doing with company computing resources and what steps you, should, you can take when something unusual occurs. Many organizations haven't provided any computer-oriented training to their users. This is something that Debbie uh, pointed out earlier as well. Users don't necessarily know what an attack might look like. Coupled with that, in the event that something does happen, they don't know what to do. An employee may be nervous about taking the wrong action and therefore won't tell anyone or try to cover up the fact that they clicked on something they shouldn't have, and now their PC is behaving in a slightly odd way. I'm still dismayed at the number of organizations that we deal with that don't keep their systems up to date with security patches. Probably a good 50% of the attacks that we see are a result of using out of date software. External threat actors are constantly probing systems looking for an entry point. And very often that entry point comes from a vulnerability in a piece of software that you may be using, whether it's the operating system or an application piece of software that you use to run your business. It's critical that you keep your systems patched. Many organizations don't have viable backups. Again, I find this hugely frustrating. A lot of organizations know they need backups and may even have them, but very often they don't test those backups to make sure that they work correctly and can be relied upon. When a ransomware attacks, for example, the very first thing that the attackers are going to look to encrypt and block your access to are your backups. They want to completely eliminate your ability to self-remediate. It's really important that from time to time, you pick a couple of files at random from your backup set and you try to restore them to make sure that the rest restoration process actually works. Finally, one of the biggest delays to taking action that we see is that organizations simply don't know who to call when things go bad. Two o'clock on a Sunday morning is no time to be Googling for help when your IT team calls to say that many systems are down and they aren't sure why. As I mentioned in our last session, it's important to take the time to organize a small core incident response team to decide who has responsibility for what, who each person will call, along with what steps to follow, and to have these steps recorded in an incident response plan. Interestingly, having an IR plan is, part of a, uh, is a core part of being GDPR compliant. Emma, slide please, thank you. Um, responding to data theft by an employee requires a careful and well-planned approach to minimize the damage to the organization and to ensure that responsible parties are held to account. You should take immediate steps to secure any stolen data once it's identified and prevent it from being further compromised. This may include disabling an employee's access to company systems and networks and changing any relevant passwords. Next, you need to gather as much information as you can about the theft, including when it happened what data was stolen, and who appears to be involved. 
This can be done through interviews with employees and the use of technology such as security cameras and data logs. It's important to keep the circle of knowledge small. Don't tell employees outside the investigation team about progress, as you may unwittingly inform the culprit about what you know. Communication is a key principle of incident response. So notifying relevant parties such as senior management, your legal team, that's both internal and external, and the police if the situation warrants it, is critical to ensure that they are aware of the situation and can give relevant advice and take appropriate action. It's critical to communicate with any parties who may be affected by the data theft, such as customers and partners, to inform them of what's happened and what steps the company is taking to address the situation. As Debbie mentioned earlier, in the UK, you have a legal obligation to notify the ICO within 72 hours. Even if you don't know much at that point, call them and let them know that you're on the case and will provide more information as soon as you have it. This will go a long way to keeping them on side if it turns out you're culpable for the loss of the data. Depending on the situation, the company may need to consider legal action against the employee and seek injunctions against the use of the data and potentially compensation for any damages incurred. Obviously, as you're listening to this webinar, you're already in touch with Nicola and Debbie who can help you navigate that process. As part of the aftermath, you need to review and update the company's policies and procedures for data security and employee conduct to prevent similar incidents from happening in the future. There may also be technical measures that need to be put in place. The post-incident review should also include a review of employee training procedures to ensure that employees are aware of company policies and the consequences of violating them. Sadly, in our experience, employees very often think they're cleverer than they actually are, that they won't get caught. They almost always do. There's a common disconnect with humans where we think, oh, this is 2023, so things are going to be different. The problem is that we're on a timeline continuum and threat actors will continue to use attacks in 2023 that were successful in 2022. So these lessons from the last year are absolutely relevant. Firstly, in July 2022, Nelnet Servicing, a technology services provider to student loan companies, notified clients about an incident impacting their website, which was used by borrowers to access account information. The Nelnet cybersecurity team discovered a vulnerability that is believed to have led to the various suspicious activities that were discovered. The following month, in August 2022, a forensics investigation revealed that the student loan account registration information was available to an unknown third party for almost 50 days due to this vulnerability. The data breach impacted approximately 2.5 million customers. So the first lesson here is that regular data security reviews can help identify potential data exposures promptly and efficiently. In this context, Reviewing and updating security measures would have highlighted, highlighted and eliminated the use of these uh, vulnerabilities before they could be exploited. Number two, in December 2022, Uber announced that threat actors had gained access to the data of more than 70,000 Uber employees and posted a quantity of that stolen corporate data. Uber stated this data breach occurred because of a third party vendor who managed Uber's mobile devices. Separately, in August 2022, DoorDash, an online food ordering and delivery platform, announced that a third party vendor was the target of a phishing campaign and personal information maintained by DoorDash was affected. The second lesson here is that companies who share data with third party organisations must ensure that they have an appropriate cybersecurity posture. Third party vendors and service providers should be closely monitored. It's important to carry out appropriate due diligence and to ensure that appropriate security protocols are in place to prevent the abuse of data by threat actors. Item number three, in November 2022, a threat actor gained access to Dropbox source code held in 130 different GitHub code repositories after a successful phishing attack. The phishing attack occurred when the threat actor impersonated the code integration and distribution platform itself to obtain employee credentials, and authentication codes. The threat actor accessed some of the Dropbox source code stored on the platform, including the access keys used by developers. Separately, in September 2022, Rockstar Games was the victim of an unauthorized third party illegal access. The threat actor, calling themselves T-Boy Uber Hacker, leaked confidential data 
including development footage of the Grand Theft Auto 6 game. The breach was thought to occur when the threat actor gained access to an employee's Slack comms account through social engineering. Both of these attacks leveraged human weakness with social engineering. So the third lesson here is that organizations need to educate employees about identifying and avoiding cyber threats, especially from social engineering. Also, it's crucial to deploy multi-factor authentication for employee access, which reminds me, currently only 60% of UK firms employ MFA. This is the cheapest and single best unauthorized access prevention technology there is. There is simply no excuse to not be using MFA in 2023. Item four, in April 2022, a company called Block, which is Cash App's parent company, confirmed that Cash App data confirmed the Cash App data breach affecting 8.2 million customers in a report to the US SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. The Cash App data breach was caused by a former employee who accessed customer financial reports as revenge against the company. Then in February 2022, a whistleblower at Credit Suisse has exposed account information for about 18,000 customers whose accounts totaled around 100 billion US dollars. It was one of the most significant customer data exposures of 2022 and oddly flew under the radar of mainstream news. So the fourth lesson here is that companies must ensure that access to critical data corresponds to an employee's specific role in the company. Auditors should periodically review users' data access levels. And when an employee leaves, the company must revoke access systems to, to those systems immediately. Additionally, implementing a zero trust framework will greatly improve organizational security. Zero trust is a, a useful initiative from various tech companies and is well worth looking at if you haven't done so yet. Finally, on this, uh, in these five lessons, in July 2022, a dark web researcher detected a post entitled 5.4 million Twitter users data is for sale on an underground dark web forum. The following month in August 2022, Twitter confirmed the data breach affecting 5.4 million Twitter accounts. This was recently updated in December to 200 million accounts. Threat actors claim to have gained access to the potential, sorry, to the personal information associated with these Twitter accounts through a previously reported software vulnerability. The vulnerability allowed third parties to access account details of users simply by submitting a phone number or email via an automated means without any authentication at all, even though each individual user had blocked this action in their privacy settings. The big lesson here is larger or more exposed organizations should consider using extended threat intelligence solutions that identify and mitigate threats across the internet and dark web. Smaller companies should strongly consider using a specialist security firm to continually monitor the corporate network with managed detection and response tools, also referred to as MDR tools. That can significantly reduce the risk of a major breach. So what's the conclusion? Threat actors focusing on data breaches seek to capture, exploit, and even weaponize sensitive data about your customers, partners, intellectual property, or company trade secrets. The most vigilant and disciplined organizations also experience data breaches. Attackers can bypass the most effective computer defenses by exploiting weaknesses, which might be technical or human or both. In this context, a comprehensive cybersecurity solution that includes employee training, robust security rules and protocols, regular security audits, and incident response planning will be an effective tool in preparing for and preventing potential data breaches. An incident response plan is one of the best ways to formalize the detection, investigation, remediation, and recovery of a data breach to mitigate its damage. I do have one more slide. How are we doing for time? We've got a little bit. So I'll run very quickly through this. So very quickly, just to finish off, I wanted to quickly mention what we typically find when we arrive to assist with a data breach. In a word, it's generally chaos. There's often conflicting internal views of what the priority is. Each senior manager is championing their own area for primacy. Meanwhile, everyone is glaring at the head of IT and thinking, if not saying out loud, this is all your fault. The lack of an IR plan is the primary cause for the chaos. There's not been any consideration given to, how, given to how the company should respond. COVID has at least given companies experience with running a remote and distributed workforce, and has also accelerated the adoption of cloud-based workflows. 
But this doesn't help when the data, either local or cloud-based, has been stolen or encrypted. We very often see companies have struggled for the first few critical hours of an incident to come up with a coherent path forward, and having cobbled one together, now feel emboldened to manage everything internally. It's typically only a few days later that the gaps in their strategy really come home to bite them. The IT department come under enormous pressure during a data breach, not only from finger pointing, but also from the calls to get the show back on the road from senior management. Any consideration about figuring out how this happened, who is responsible or gathering evidence to support an investigation either doesn't happen or is given a very low priority. Eventually, out of ideas and with a team of IT engineers living on coffee and no sleep, we're asked to come in and assist. By now, though, much of the damage has been done. Useful evidence of what happened has been overwritten and lost, but depressingly often we find that entry points into the system remain active and are possibly even still being exploited. A cursory examination of logs, if they exist far enough in the past, often show the company has been compromised for months and that nobody noticed. When speaking to senior managers and board level personnel, the laser focus of business recovery and preventing reputational harm very often pushes reporting and communication, communicating to stakeholders off into the never-never. Getting the ear of senior leadership and adopting best practice at this point is very difficult, but having them speak to their insurance company or external legal team can focus the mind on the potential losses and liability, and that can be a turning point. The result of all of this is increased cost, both in financial terms and also in reputational harm and longer lead times to get the business back to usual. What is depressing for us as, as incident response specialists is that all of this grief is so easily avoided by sitting down with an IR specialist in advance and spending a day or two calmly thinking about how the response process can be fitted to the business. Dealing with incidents is not rocket surgery. You're already on the right path by talking to your legal team at DMH Stellard and by listening to this webinar. Preparation isn't time consuming, costly, or administratively burdensome, but it does take an ongoing commitment to listen to specialist advice and shrug off the, it won't happen to me mindset that we very often encounter. Well, that's me. Okay, thank you very much for listening and I hope that was helpful. Nicola, back to you. Great, thank you very much, John. That's really helpful. So um, I failed to mention at the start, apologies. If anyone had any questions, we have a Q&A box. Uh, a few people have put some questions in there already. So that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna have a look through and uh, I'm gonna put Debbie and John on the spot. Um, I'm not gonna do it to myself, I'm gonna do it to them. Uh, let me see, uh, what have we got? Oh, that's a good question. That is a really good one. Um, John, I think this is one for you. How long do you think it takes to create an instant response plan? So if you're looking at a business that's around sort of a small business, uh, and the question is sort of asking around 75 in employees, how, how long should that take? Yeah, it's kind of one of those how long is a piece of string questions. It, generally, it's um, it depends on the complexity of the business, how large it is, the, the number of employees, the number of sites they're distributed across, what fact, you know, what uh, industry they're in, are they regulated or not? But generally, uh, even the biggest and largest and most complex will only take about a week or so. And a smaller organization, as, as you described, say 70 employees, 75 employees or so, probably only two or three days. It's, uh, it's not a, a, a big complex process. Okay, great. Um... One for you, Debbie, if you don't mind. Uh, a, a, another very good question. So we've talked about the legislation that's currently in place, but is there anything on the horizon that might actually start to affect how people's data is going to be used? Um, yes. <laughs> um, so the, um, there was a new piece of legislation introduced in November last year so very new, um, called the uh, Product Security and Telecommunications Infrastructure Act. It rolls off the tongue. Um, but um, this piece of legislation um, has been introduced to look at um, products which are aimed at consumers, so consumable products, where they include an an IT element which could hold personal data. So when we're looking at the internet of things, you know, your smart fridge, your smart telly, et cetera. So, 
you know, looking at the Dixon's case, this is probably um, something that would be very close to that. It's the, the legislation is is trying to make sure that any personal data that might be included in those types of products is either minimal or at least um, minimizes vulnerabilities. So for example, it bans, it's, it's set to ban default passwords, things like that. Um, it will um, try and ensure that the relevant products have a vulnerability disclosure policy. So if there are vulnerabilities in this in these particular products, then those are made known to individuals so that they know how they might be able to set passwords or, or use products in a particular way, which would help, help reduce those vulnerabilities. Um, it's also the, the legislation finally would, would try and um, ensure that the, that the length of time that those relevant products um, would need to go before they receive any security updates. So for example, if there are um, known bugs that might appear in the um, internet connectivity within these products, <clears throat> then it might be that the, that the consumers have to run a security update on those products to make sure that any of those patches are done to um, uh, keep those bugs or any of those vulnerabilities locked down as quickly as possible. So it's very new and it applies to manufacturers, distributors and importers of these types of consumable products. So I suppose if that is your business and that is what you do, um, it will be important to start looking at this because there is a 12 month implementation period for these types of um, sort of data security issues to be put in place within these products. Great. Something else for businesses to think about. Gosh, it's never ending, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> connected, connected to data, but um, but something to um, consider in it in its consumable product stage. So yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> let me have a quick look. Well, I think we've probably got time for a couple more. Uh, oh, there's one for me. Um, what about if we as a business want to claim losses incurred? Can we do that? Um, yes, obviously, I focused uh, on claims that would be brought against you as a business by individuals. Um, but as a business, yes, absolutely. If there's a supplier that has caused this data breach, what you need to look at is your contract with them. Uh, in that contract, you're likely to have indemnity provisions. Um, so you can look at liability limitations on liabilities as well. Um, but uh, also insurance is something you should be looking at as a business. Um, John made a very valid point when we were talking about this before that with cyber insurance policies, businesses often have those in place and think that they cover everything. Uh, and it's only when a loss event actually occurs that you realize it doesn't cover something like malware. Um, and then you're a little bit stuck. So sometimes uh, business sort of interruption policies might be better than a cybersecurity policy. But the starting point, if the data breach has been caused by your vendor or your supplier or any other party with whom you've got a contract is to look at the indemnity provisions and see if you've got a claim there. Um, I think one further question, let's have a quick look. Um, uh, Oh, what about certification of plans, John? That's one for you. Um, is it something that needs to, I mean, can people get their plans certified or do they need to? Um, at, at the larger level, yes, you can. So there are ISO standards for incident response, but really these only apply to, you know, mega corporations, big global co companies and so on, who have got the resources to go through the ISO certification process. For most small UK businesses, no, there isn't really a certification process for an ICE, for, for um, an incident response plan. But, you know, any good um, information security company should be able to look at your plan and, and, and give it a, a tick in the box to say, yes, this covers all the, all the things that you need. There's a couple of useful bonuses from having an incident response plan, though. Firstly, is that uh, if you approach your insurance company, uh, either you know, with business continuity insurance or, or a cyber policy, and you say, hey, listen, we've got an incident response plan, here it is, uh, that may actually reduce uh, the premiums that you have to pay. Um, but the other thing is auditors love incident response plans. If you, if you are in an industry where you need to be regularly audited or you have audits from time to time, uh, making sure that your auditors know that you have an IR plan will, will certainly get you lots of brownie points uh, during the audit. Brilliant. Great. Well, I think that's us.
done for today. Thank you very much for everybody who's joined us. I hope you found this useful and interesting. If you've ever got any questions, we're all always available. Our details are on the screen now, uh, and we're very happy to assist with, with anything that you need in future. Even if it's just a quick call or a question, please feel free to contact us. Have a good rest of your days, and uh, hopefully we'll speak to, to you at, at some point in the future. All the very best. Thank you again. Bye-bye.